emergency pediatric radiographs. Oh, incidentally, I, I have taken these, uh, they do represent about 25 years of my radiology experience. About a third of these cases are cases I saw myself. About a third of them have been sent to me by my colleagues, either at VRAD or in academics, or um, even my old private practice partners all knew my predilection for a good case. Uh, and then about a third of them have come to me through quality assurance, overreading, medical malpractice, sentinel event evaluations, things of that nature. So that's uh, the origins of the cases we'll be seeing. All right, we'll start off with a case of epiglottitis. There is that enlarged epiglottis. You can see it's rounded and smooth, really easily identifiable. In addition, you can see the area epiglottic fold, which is distinct from the epiglottis, and that's an important finding. Uh, those swell right along with the epiglottis. Another important finding here is the vallecula. I was always taught to watch for the vallecula to disappear in epiglottitis, and frequently it does, but don't hang your hat completely on that. Uh, kids love to play tricks on you, and one of their favorites is to be air hungry and distend their hypopharynx. So if you catch them at just the right moment, even if that vallecula is narrowed with swelling, uh, it can distend briefly. Similarly, you can see the supraglottic region is also somewhat distended. Lastly, you can appreciate the soft tissues around the glottis are actually pretty prominent and outline the laryngeal ventricle. So that is a case of acute epiglottitis. Interestingly, you know, they didn't even have a vaccine for this when I was in medical school. And once they developed it, apparently it has not actually altered the incidence of this condition. Interesting. Uh, the other comment I would make on epiglottitis is this is all over all board exams. It was in the US MLE about every 10th question uh, when I was taking that long ago. Uh, there were cases of it when I took the radiology boards for that matter as well. And in the old days of oral boardsmanship, they always told you, just hammer this, right? If I see this film, I'm gonna go find that kid. I'm never gonna let him out of my sight. I'm gonna carry him to the ER myself, right? That's the kind of thing they want. How that manifests in the current testing environment, I don't know, but I don't think you can overstate the emergent nature of this condition. All right, our next one. First off, let's look at the asymmetry in the chest. Another of the kids' favorite tricks is to rotate, and it can make it really difficult to determine volume loss, uh, you know, or even for that matter, consolidation. But that left lung is too dense, and of course you all know, go by the posterior interspaces, they are somewhat narrowed on the left, and even allowing for the rotation, uh, I think you can safely say we've got an atelectatic left lung. So here's the important point here. We've got a metallic density in the hilar region. Now, of course, you can have an aspirated foreign body that acts as a ball valve and causes hyperinflation of the involved lung. That is the case with inorganic materials, plastics, metal, Okay, and so here you can see with this density, we've got a metallic density in the hilar region, and likely we have hyperinflation in an abnormal right lung. If the aspirated entity, first of all, is invisible, as it will frequently be, and organic, that will tend to be hydropic, peas, beans. It will soak up fluid, swell, and occlude the bronchus completely. And so if you don't see an inorganic foreign body, then you start thinking, could this be an organic aspiration and uh, causing atelectasis as opposed to inorganic aspiration causing hyperinflation? All right, so here's the cute part of this. Uh, it actually came a very high ranking radiologist at VRAD who works on the QA committee uh, actually uh, missed this, but it is, Tough to see, but now I think you can probably put it all together. That's an earring backing. And there is the post with that little groove in it that's so familiar in appearance. So that's what you get for piercing the ears of your less than one year old child. So that is a foreign body aspiration, again, an inorganic one. 
All right, our next one. Well, the first thing to note is the relatively uh, difficult call, I think this is, left upper lobe atelectasis with a pneumothorax. I find this a uh, challenging call all the time. In addition, another challenging one here, that ill-defined density suggesting right middle lobe atelectasis, certainly consolidation, but volume loss as well. So let's look more closely. In this case, when you have an atelectatic left upper lobe and a pneumothorax, it becomes really challenging. I've always been taught, look for a line, a line, a line when you're looking for an apical pneumothorax, not an edge like this. So I think it takes some guts to, uh, to actually make that call, but that is the right one, that is a pneumothorax. And then again, the ill-defined kind of wispy nature of right middle lobe atelectasis can give us all pause. It can be a really tough thing to see. So this case always reminds me of an asthmatic I saw when I was an internal medicine resident, officer of the day at the Vermont VA. And in came this guy who had a, a chest x-ray very much like this. He was wheezing all over the place and he had two areas of consolidation with minimal volume loss, uh, unappreciable by my eye. And so I admitted him for pneumonia. Uh, the next day, he had an x-ray and there were, I think it was right upper lobe and left lower lobe consolidation and the previously dense areas had resolved. And I accused the film library of giving me the wrong film. Uh, these mucus plugs that result in this atelectasis can migrate all around. They can clear in no time and give you a strikingly dynamic appearance to the chest x-ray. Uh, in addition, of course, the pneumo is a particular risk of asthmatics, right? They are trying to breathe past those occlusive mucus plugs, and they can create such a negative pleural pressure that they give themselves pneumos. All right, our next one, seen by my friend Chris Zilak when we were in private practice. Uh, he leaned over to me and poked me in the shoulder and said, hey, what do you think of that right there? And sure enough, that is a healing rib fracture with some uh, relatively mature callus actually out there in the lateral posterior rib. Uh, just a classic spot for a squeezing injury. And that is of course what this turned out to be. So my old mentor, George Barnes used to say, it's okay to miss a pneumonia on a kid, he'll come back, uh, but you miss a rib fracture and that is a kid that may not return. All right, a classic case of eosinic, eosinophilic granuloma, a vertebra plana presentation. You can see it here on the frontal and on the lateral. This is a neat case though, it shows a few important points. One is, note that this is really affecting the right side predominantly. The left side is actually maintaining some of its height. And that is a characteristic of EG that is worth knowing. They tend to progress from one side to the other. Note also how the pedicles are maintained. They look perfectly normal there in position and size. And that is because in addition to going from side to side, these lesions typically progress from front to back. And you'll usually have sparing of the posterior elements. And it's even fairly rare to see significant loss of height in that posterior cortex. So that is a classic vertebra plana. Uh, presentation of eosinophilic granuloma. All right, our next one. Two metacarpals looking a little moth-eaten, a little uh, hyperemic osteopenia, and you can see the periostitis present in both of these. This is a classic presentation for sickle cell crisis the hand-foot crisis that many of them make an initial presentation with. These are probably early bone infarcts, and they will present with a very hot, swollen red hand. In fact, if you sit back for a second, you can actually see the soft tissue swelling around the hand itself, uh, very prominent here. So that is a sickle cell hand crisis. All right, a little free air in a, uh, in a supine infant. I, I've been trying to coach myself into just saying gas. You know, if you say air, you may or may not be right. 
If you say gas, you'll be right all the time. So I'm trying to shift myself away from that. So here you can see there's clearly subdiaphragmatic gas, wouldn't fool you, and a very nice prominent falciform ligament, the so-called football sign, uh, for once clearly visible. So I think that's nice to get a sense of the typical distribution arc and appearance of one uh, that is actually visible. So over here though, look at that. There's also a Wrigler sign. There is a collection of intraperitoneal gas outlining the outer aspect of a small bowel loop there. So let's look first at that falciform and then at the Wrigler sign. You can see that bowel wall is outlined right here. All right, this is an important one because it is such a potential game changer. You're certainly not going to miss the dilated small bowel, and I think everybody would call a high-grade small bowel obstruction here. But if you don't look specifically for it, you're never going to see those, that air collection there in the right scrotum, clearly indicating the presence of an inguinal hernia and the cause of all of this. Uh, so it can be a real embarrassment when you get scooped on a hernia. I actually got scooped as an ER doctor. I called in a transfer, was loading a guy up in the ambulance and said, I got a small bowel obstruction coming in. And the, the guy in the receiving end said, well, have you checked him for a hernia? <laughs> and I stood there, had to run out to the ambulance and uh, pull a guy's gown up as they drove away. So it was uh, it was worth remembering. And I'm uh, still scanning the scrotum of every abdominal film now. All right, here's a great one. This is, again, a neonate. And you can see there is uh, there is pneumatosis of the colon in multiple locations. It's kind of neat. There's an air-filled, probably normal, appendix extending up there into the left upper quadrant. But a nice case of pneumatosis of the colon, almost always necrotizing enterocolitis and very frequently due to CMV infection. In fact, if you sit back again, look at the bulging flanks. Certainly you can get in trouble calling pediatric hepatosplenomegaly, but in this case, I think you'd probably get away with it. And that was another manifestation of this patient's CMV infection. All right, our last one in the pediatrics. This is from my old mentor, George Barnes. I think it, it may date back to the 1960s. Uh, here, there is a gas collection. You can see there's actually an air fluid level in the middle of it, and there's a less conspicuous gas collection in the lower half there of that circle. So that is a subdiaphragmatic abscess. It's very common with appendicitis that it goes right up that uh, right pericolic gutter, and it ends up giving you a subdiaphragmatic or perihepatic abscess. I've got several such examples uh, in, my, in my files. In addition, you've got some faint calcifications. There are actually two of them there. And that, uh, in the old days, was a pretty much definitive indication for an appendectomy. We know, of course, uh, that was a bit of an overreaction. Now with CT, we see them all the time. So there is that lower, less visible collection. You can see an air fluid level again in the, in the middle there. And then there are these two small, right, lower quadrant calcifications, pretty faint indicating the origin of all this was appendicitis. All right, well, that is our collection of emergency pediatric radiographs.